Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 27th, 2012. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. For this week, Dan Detmers, engineer at Gorst Valley Hops, tells us the best way to harvest, dry, and store your homegrown hops. Assuming the weather was kind to you this year, you want to make sure to get the most out of your own cones. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter. I'm Basic Brewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you want to shop for something on Amazon, don't go to Amazon first. Go to our website, basicbrewing.com. Click on the Amazon ad. It will take you to Amazon where you can shop as usual, but the difference is that we will get a chunk of your purchases. So uh, and the, the great thing about it is it doesn't cost you any extra, just that uh, extra time that it takes to click on our site, and we greatly appreciate those who do that. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. They work similarly. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone and Android podcast apps on their respective stores. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app, too. Our buddy Bob Stimsky is the first to submit data for the collective experiment, uh, collective collaborative experiment on chilling methods. Uh, Bob compared immersion chilling versus no chill. No surprise there. <laughs> also, no spoilers. I'm not going to tell you what, uh, what he found out yet. If you're taking part in the experiment, don't forget the deadline for submitting your data is October 8th. You can find the form at basicbrewing.com slash experiment. And please give us as much detail as you can about your process. We're looking forward to the results. Week after next, we may be taking the week off from this podcast because Andy Sparks and I will be in Denver for the Great American Beer Festival. But don't worry, though, because... Uh, we will be gathering lots of content for you, at least trying to, uh, to play for you when we get back. And I hope to see you out there. If you see us walking around, definitely flag us down and say hi. Just uh, one more thing before we hear from Dan. Uh, a lot of you sent me the links to this uh, story about the Birmingham, Alabama beer and wine store that got raided by the police because they were selling homebrew equipment. Crazy, right? Home brewing is illegal in Alabama, but they weren't brewing there. They were just selling the gear and ingredients. And what's weird, well, one of the things that's weird is that they took the equipment, but they apparently left the ingredients. And they took books about brewing, too. Just wondering, did they pile them up in front of the store and set them on fire? Are brewers in Alabama going to have to start memorizing brewing books and reciting them to each other? That's really all I wanted to say about that. Other than uh, for for those who wonder, you know, every, every now and then I get an email from somebody saying, it doesn't matter to me whether home brewing is legal or not. I'm going to do it anyway, and it's no big deal. Well, sometimes it is a big deal, and we need to get home brewing legal everywhere. And this is your prime example of why we need to do it. Okay, getting off the, climbing down off the soapbox now. I feel better. Uh, <laughs> in my neck of the woods... Growing hops is uh, was a tough thing to do this year. It was is very hot and very dry. Uh, however, I'm hoping that there are those of you who have big, juicy hop cones waiting to be picked and processed somewhere in the country or around the world. Well, Dan Detmers is here to give you some great info on what to do with them. Well, Dan Detmers, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, hi, James. Thanks for having me on. Met you in person at the Great Taste of the Midwest, up there at the uh, the Gorse Valley uh, booth, I guess. And then, impressively enough, you actually remember. <laughs> it's that's a that's a long day, four or five hours, whatever it comes out to be, of sampling. <laughs> well, I I've learned to moderate over the years, uh, and and it was fairly early in the day for me, so you know. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That was about two o'clock before things really get rolling. <laughs> but 
But I th- I, it was a great event. I thought I thought people were, uh, by and large, pretty well behaved uh, up there. So that uh, that is it's it's amazing. The the police love working that that detail because uh, they'll they'll get a special assignment to it, and pretty much all they do is stand around and wave and shake hands and talk to people. There isn't usually too much for them to do. <laughs> as well, as one cop said, it's the biggest collection of happy drunks I've ever seen. So <laughs> it's a good time. Well, hopefully, I, I hope that I can I uh, can go again one day. I don't know if they'll. I guess they'll they'll wrangle me a, a, another press pass or two. But uh, I, you know, I'm not going to be up there to stand in line or to to do the lottery or whatever. So it's a, it's a tough <laughs> ticket to get. All, all you have to do is get in line at three in the morning on the day that they sell the tickets, and you're pretty much guaranteed to get one. <laughs> As I said, not likely to happen. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll work on another press pass for you. <laughs> now uh, we're ta- we're here to talk about hops, appropriately enough. Uh, and you get you said that this is the time of year where your your inbox and uh, even your front door is uh, is attacked by people asking. What do I do with these hops that I got on these vines in my house or in my yard or at my farm? That's absolutely right. This this time of year, and I love the fact that so many people are trying to grow their own. They're trying to improve on the quality and the freshness freshness that they get. Um, you know, they're experimenting. They're seeing what's out there, and and some of these people are even just growing, hedging their bet against the next shortage that comes up. Because as as many of you remember, back in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, there were certain varieties we just couldn't get for home brewing. Um, but this time of year, everybody gets to the point where they've been watering it, they've been caring for their plants so well, and now it's time to harvest, and then what do you do? You got this big pile of hops. The big question is, how do I dry it? How long do I dry it? When am I done? Did I pick it at the right time? And then how do I store it? And, you know, there's there's thousands of forums, there's thousands of articles out there. I just want to give my own perspective, I guess, and put it on the record with the uh, with the obviously the leading authority uh, podcast here out there <laughs> um, to put it on the record. What I have found over our testing and the the small scale commercial level to be the best way to dry your hops, to know when they're done and to preserve as much of the flavors and aromas and oils that you possibly can. Well, I'm all for that. Now, this year, I had no problems at all harvesting and drying my hops because uh, they all were toasty. On the vine, because <laughs> that's I, one way of putting it. It yeah. was a it was a hot year, wasn't it? Oh man, hot and dry, and unfortunately, I don't uh, irrigate my hop yards, which which is uh, is usually not a problem uh, for my Cascades. They usually do pretty good, and I'm and I am able usually to get a couple of harvests off of it. Uh, but this year, man, so hot and so dry that it was just a. I'll be lucky if. Uh, if they come back next year, it was it was really bad. But let's say let's go through this step by step. Uh, let's say that you had a good year. You were in a good uh, in a in a good climate, and you took care of the hops, and you have a bumper crop of nice, beautiful cones. First of all, we got to figure out: Are these things ready to harvest? How do we figure out when they're ready to pick? Ah, uh, well, the key there is use your nose, use your eyes, use your sense of touch, use all your senses. Number one, they should actually smell like the hops you intend to uh, brew with. Uh, A lot of people take a look at them, and they'll be big, and they'll be green, and they'll be plump, and they look so wonderful, and they pick them, and that's when they found out they picked them just a little bit too early. Um, That's when they're they're still developing the lupulin. They're still developing the the alpha acids and all the oils and aromas. That all comes really late in the cycle. And if you pick it too early, they won't have matured enough. And what you'll end up with is is these big, luscious green cones that don't offer too much for your beer. You actually want to go just a little bit beyond that. And often you'll actually see the, the cones starting to open up like a pine cone. You might see a little bit of browning on the end. Definitely what you'll see is when you pick one off and rip it open, you're going to look for those lupulin sacs. They're little yellow, school bus yellow to a little bit darker than that sacs, and that's where the alpha acids lie that, that you want to get your bitterness. Those should be nice, bright, bright yellow, maybe even yellow-orange. If they're still a pale yellow or, or not even visible, you know, hold off. you still got a couple weeks to go. Um, the other thing is those, those cones should have a papery feel, and everybody says, okay, what does that mean? 
And as as one one uh, home grower put it to me, he's like, "It's a feel that you know after somebody showed you." But okay, <laughs> if if you're on the first year growing, it's it's kind of hard. The the best way I can describe is take a piece of uh, paper towel and crumple it up, and then give it a squeeze, and you feel how that kind of feels papery and how it springs back. When your hops feel like that, they should be close to harvest time. Uh, now get that paper towel wet, and you feel how it kind of crumples and it doesn't spring back, and it feels a little mushy. That's what your hops feel like just before they're ready to be ripe. So I say that I get two harvests from my cascades. Uh, in my climate, it, am I am I doing it right? Is it is it possible that I'm actually getting two harvests, or am I actually uh, picking the hops maybe too early? Uh, I mean, they they seem like they're ready to pick. Oh, oh, you can definitely get on the homebrew level. You can get uh, two harvests out of your plants. Um, what we see in our fields is the the top of the plant, which is actually where uh, eighty to ninety percent of the uh, harvest actually comes from. That usually ripens first, and that's ready to go. The stuff that's way down lower on the plant uh, is usually a little bit more immature. So for for us on the commercial level, you know, we don't. We, we don't have time to handpick. Uh, we did that for a couple of years and said, enough of that. Uh, we were looking at 45 minutes to b- per bind. When you take 45 minutes per, per bind out times, what, 1,000 to 1,200 binds mm-hmm. per acre, uh, you're talking six to 700 man hours of labor, and you just can't get that done. Hence why we, we put together some mechanical harvesting equipment that's affordable. But on the home grower level, I highly encourage you to handpick, number one, because you can pick the ones that are ripest and leave the others behind and come back and pick those probably two weeks later. But also, you have additional growing season where that bind can stay up and continue to absorb sunlight and grow and strengthen your root stock so you get a better harvest the next year. On order of 6 to almost 30% better the next year versus just cutting the thing down whenever the time is for you to harvest. Yeah, now there, there's different ways that you can... Uh that you can develop to make picking easier on yourself, you know, putting uh, putting the hop bind on a on a pulley or running it through an eye an eye bolt or something like that up at your uh, whatever you call those those things. Uh they run the string through. Uh I I'm not that smart. I get up on a ladder and and uh, <laughs> and pick the hops. Uh but but it, that you know, it does give you the opportunity to uh select each individual hop cone and and get the best uh, the best harvest the best quality out of your homegrown hops. Oh yeah, if you can find a way to drop them down, either uh, just tie your twine up and drop it down, or you have a pulley system, or however you want to do it, get it down on the ground where you can pick nicely and uh, maybe put a little shade for yourself because uh, I bet you you sweat it a little bit when you're picking this year. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As I, as I say, this year was not a problem. Uh, <laughs> so after, uh, after, so you're saying uh, don't when if you get in a position where you're at the end of the year and all the hops on a particular vine look great, uh, you're saying don't cut them down. If if at all possible, leave them growing, tie them right back up, or if you need to cut it to take it back to some place to harvest, take a look at it. And usually the bottom three, four feet probably aren't producing as much as the top. Think about just leaving that little bit there. Um, that's what we'll actually do when we harvest our commercial field. Uh, we go out, we take a look at them, we cut it off the top, and then we come down and say, hey, most of the production ends right about here. Let's leave the rest out of here so it can catch a little bit of sunlight and grow. Yeah, we went, Andy Sparks and I went up to, uh, uh, Dave Wills does, you know, with Fresh Hops, has his Hop Madness uh, up up there in his neck of the woods every year and they you know when they commercial when they commercially harvest their hops they cut them off right at the ground uh, exact and that's where you want to do eventually when you're when you're ready to put it to bed and put it to the winter you want to cut it down within the foot of the ground um but you know if you're if your harvest starts in august or you know if you're really far south i don't know you might might have had some times you could start late july that still gives you all of August, September, October for growing season. Give your plant a break. Let it uh, let it take in the time to to grow a little bit more. Now I, I wait until my hops are all the way dead looking. You know, there's they're all brown, and I think it's they're easier to pull off the strings that way anyway. So oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, we use we use choir twine, so that way we can just compost the whole thing, put it right back on the field, put those nutrients right back where you need them. Now. We now that we've got our our cones individually handpicked for quality, 
Uh, <laughs> you, you, you've you sorted out all the stems. You've sorted out the leaves. Give them a good shake so the aphids and stink bugs can fly away. <laughs> <laughs> and spiders. There's a spider every now and then. Exactly. Now, and, and, you know, when they talk about integrated pest management, I can tell you the biggest problem we had with our uh, mechanical harvesting equipment is if somebody missed a bird's nest and that sucker got in there, oh, that, that just crammed things up. But, <laughs> but... Our horticulture, she was pretty happy that the birds found it so nice and suitable to actually be living in our hop yard. There you go. Uh, they, they're taking care of some of those bugs uh, themselves there. That's right. Well, now at this point, this is the, the first, the next question that comes up for most people is, should I wash them? Well, yeah, it would have been great to wash them maybe on the bind, but at this point, you're getting ready to dry, so you don't really want to be adding moisture to them. Um, and besides, anything that's on them will die in the boil. Uh, plus, uh, don't worry about those bugs while you're drying. They're all going to crawl out and try to get away, which leads me to another suggestion of picking your drying location. The kitchen countertop might not be the best place because <laughs> your wife and or husband and or kids might not appreciate spiders, aphids, stink bugs, and everything else crawling across the surfaces where you prepare food. <laughs> well, so uh, you are, uh, you guys, with your small operation up there, you are trying to develop uh, methods where you are drying with less heat than the bigger yeah. operations, right? Exactly. I mean, the, the bigger operations, you know, they're, they're doing their best out there, but you got to keep in mind, they're talking 300, 400 acres at a time. They need to get stuff picked, get it into the dryer, and get it out in time for the next day's harvest to come in. So they do what they have to do to get the job done. Um, and, you know, not to slam anybody, but if you're sending your, your hops to go into some, you know, 55-calorie beer, maybe flavor isn't the most important thing, right? <laughs> I don't. I don't know who uh, might uh, might uh, be listening to this, but well, we'll just leave it at that. We won't name any names. But <laughs> for us, all of our hops are going to craft brewers. They're going to craft brewers within about fifty miles of whatever field we're picking them from, and those guys, they're folk. I mean, when you pick up a craft beer, you're expecting quality and flavor. So of course, those brewers want quality and flavor. And we knew we knew we'd get a little kickstart from the beginning when we started Gorse Valley because people wanted local, right? The craft brewers are selling to the local markets. So they want to buy local. So we thought, hey, that's great. But I remember a great quote from Paul Newman. He said, my face on the bottle of dressing will get you to buy it the first time. But if you don't like the flavor of that dressing, you're never going to come back, right? So we figured the same thing with our hops. We wanted to make something high enough quality that, hey, the brewer is coming by it the first time for the novelty to say it's local, to make a, an all-Wisconsin beer, to make an all-Minnesota beer, to make whatever. But we want to make sure that the quality was there so they would keep coming back and coming back. So at Gorse Valley, I'm, I'm the engineer, by the way, for, for those that didn't know. So my job is, is the drying equipment, picking equipment, designing all that, processing equipment. Um, we also have a couple of horticulturalists. Of course, you got to have a business manager. And then we have a chemist. So Joe, our chemist, we would go back and forth. I mean, when, when I first got involved in this, my background is about 15 years in the food processing industry. And I was told, figure out a way to get these hops dry. I hey, not a problem. At one point, I uh, worked on the invention of a microwave clothes dryer. I said, let's do it. We'll just hit these suckers with microwaves. We'll have them dried in about an hour. Joe's response was, uh, you're going to snarvel flack the bibble blackfin poly. <laughs> I, I, I still don't know what the heck he's talking about. <laughs> but he was pretty adamant that that wouldn't work and it would affect the flavor. Is he a Vogon by any chance? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Most of the time he talks, and I have no idea what he's saying, but I can tell when his voice goes up and he gets agitated that I'm going down the wrong path. <laughs> so then I, I started talking about near-wave infrared. I started talking about all these different methodologies. And, I, and, of course, I mentioned heat, and he just kept spouting all these chemical names and formulas and diseases and problems. And I finally said, Joe, what, what am I supposed to do? And he's like, you got to think about them as roses. Think about them as roses, Dan. We want to preserve the aroma. We want to preserve the quality. We want to preserve all the all those alpha acids and other chemicals that we've built up all year. If you go and hit them with high temperature heat, they're going to degrade. If you hit them with all your other gamma rays and microwaves, they're going to degrade. Low and slow. I'm like, okay. 
But at the mean, at the same time, James uh, Altweiss, who you already had on here, you know, he's the guy in charge, and he's going low and slow is great, but we got to get this done at some point. Mm-hmm. All right, so, so the answer is low temperature, right? 140 degrees. The reason 140 degrees is picked in the Pacific Northwest, once you start getting above that, you start degrading your alpha acids, and that affects the bittering, and that affects their bottom line. But they're adding heat in order to drop the relative humidity because there's two things that get these hops dry. It's airflow and relative humidity. The more air you can get across them, the more moisture you can remove, and the lower the relative humidity, the more that moisture that air that you are passing across can carry away. So they add heat in order to drop your relative humidity so it can carry more moisture away. Well, I thought, all right, what's the other way we can do it? The other way is dehumidification. Your your air conditioner, your dehumidifiers. The problem is these little hops, when you pick them, they're 80% moisture content, and you want to get them down to, well, for the home grower, you want to get them down to at least 12%. For the commercial grower, we need to get it down to 8% so we can pelletize. That's a lot of moisture. Basically, we're going down to one fifth the original weight, a little bit, little bit more. That, so that's a lot of moisture to get rid of. And if we were going to use a dehumidifier to do that whole thing, that we'd be spending a thirty thousand dollar dehumidifier to just take care of a quarter acre of hops. Well, no small scale commercial grower can handle that. And certainly on the residential scale, you know, I don't know that that you want to tax your air conditioner, dehumidifier, and your house that hard. So. What I started looking at was I looked at what are called isotherms for these hops. Basically, what relative humidity do I need to get down to in order to get the moisture content down to 8%? And what I found was above about 15% moisture content in these hops, I can have just about 99% relative humidity air and still get it out of there. So what I advocate with our growers and what I advocate with, with the home grower is start out with airflow. Don't add heat. Don't add uh, anything dehumidification. Just let the air flow across them however you possibly can. Keep them in the shade, right? You don't want to set them out in the sun because uh, Joe got excited when I said something about UV light. Something about the sunlight breaks down those chemicals too. (laughs) So keep them in in a a garage. Keep them uh, in your house if your family can handle the smell. Someplace cool, dry, under 100 degrees preserves pretty much all the oils and as much of the aroma as you can. If you can keep it under 90 or even under 80, you are in great shape. Um, Now you're going to be preserving all the oils and most of the aromas, and you're going to get most of that moisture gone almost for free, right? All it's going to cost you is is a little bit of fan power. So you're you're saying basically uh, put them in a warm, not hot, low humidity place, Move yep. some air across them. And and even if you can't do the low humidity, as long as you're moving air, you're moving in the right direction. Well, for my home growing, my favorite method, and, and everybody hates this because it's so simple. You take the screen door off the front door, you lay it on two cinder blocks, you put the cones on top of it, and maybe you put a box fan on it blowing, right? And just put that in the garage, right? It's going to be out of the sun. Uh, as long as you got some airflow going through that garage, you're going to be removing that moisture. I did something similar with uh, with my hops uh, using window screens and cardboard boxes. And then uh, we've, we've got a, a, a spare bedroom uh, where I put all the hops, you know, away from the wife and family uh, yep. <laughs> and the dogs. And, uh, you know, I was I, I, I turned off the, the air conditioner vents in there, so it was a little warmer, but it's inside the house, so it's it's drier than it is outside. Uh, and I didn't use a fan, but still in, in the matter of a couple, three days, you know, the, the uh, hops were, yep. you know, kind of crispy uh, feeling, you know, dry that's, and, and nice. That's, that's, that's awesome. If you can do it in your house because you're going to have the air conditioning to keep the humidity levels down. Um, what, what, what you'll see is even out in your garage, even on days when it's raining, and, and this is what the way, the way I, I talk to my growers, uh, I'll talk them through the process and then I'll explain to them within the first four years, you're going to screw it up twice. And, and that's pretty much what it's been. Uh, I always hope they screw up the first year and the second year when they don't have as high a yield instead of screwing up the second and the third year when, <laughs> you know, that's, it's costing them some serious profit. Mm. Um, but what, what people will do is they'll bring in that harvest, right? And you've been out in the sun picking all day, 8, 10, 12-hour day. You're exhausted, 
And you look at that pile of hops and you look at outside and it's raining and you think, man, I just don't feel like dealing with them anymore. I'll take care of them in the morning. By the time morning comes, it's, it's a lot of times it's already too late because that pile of hops has started to compost because they're so full of moisture. Uh. I tell them, get them into their oats, get them into your dryer, get air moving over them. Even when it's raining outside, there's still enough room in that air to pick up moisture and carry it away and carry it down to at least 20%. And now once you hit that somewhere in the range of 23 down to about 17%, you're going to see telltale signs that you're getting close to being dry. The, the cone is going to start to really open up. Uh, it'll look like a pine cone after a fire because it's, if there was seeds in there, which hopefully you don't have, um, those will be falling out at that point. Uh, and it's getting really light and, and flaky, uh, really, really papery, uh, crispy as you kind of put it. And if you, if you broke one open, what I like to do is take the strig, the, the stem in the middle, and, and touch it to my lips. It shouldn't feel moist and damp, but it shouldn't feel brittle yet at this point. It'll, it'll, it'll still be a little supple, but it won't feel like you're, you're painting your lips with moisture. Now you know you're, you're just about there, and now at this point you have to ask yourself, can I get them dry the rest of the way? Well, if it's really hot and humid outside, sitting in your garage is probably not going to do it um, because you – in order to finish them off, you need to get to something less than 50% relative humidity. So that's where bringing them inside your air-conditioned house is perfect because most of us, when we have the air conditioning running, it's keeping your house around 50 to 35, 38%. Um, so that's perfect. But, okay, if, if your wife is like mine and just can't stand the smell, uh, which is pretty inconvenient when you come home from the hop yard and you smell like hops, um, <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're getting a new house, and there was a suggestion made of putting an outdoor shower just for when Daddy comes home from the farm. Uh, <laughs> we're still negotiating on that. <laughs> Luckily, harvest is usually when it's still warm outside. Uh, not now, though. We, we still have a few hops out in the field that need to be picked, and like I mentioned before, it's 48 degrees right now as a high in Wisconsin, so it's, it's going to be a little cold. <laughs> but if you need to get that last little bit of moisture out and bringing it inside the house isn't the possible, Build yourself a little tent. So go out in the garage, put those hops on a screen. At this point, you don't need the fan blowing over them. Get your, your dehumidifier out of the basement, borrow one from a neighbor, go out to your, your local super center and buy one for 100 bucks. Put it next to those hops and then build a little plastic tent around it and seal it up as best you can, and that will draw out the rest of that moisture in no time flat. Um, what we typically see is about... Uh, a day and a half to two and a half days of just letting air pass over them uh, will get you down there most of the way. Once you put them in a little tent with a dehumidifier, another 12 to 24 hours will finish them off. So how do you figure out? I mean, you guys have labs and things that you can figure oh, yeah. out the, the beginning moisture content and the ending moisture content. Other than just sensory, you know, touching the thing to our lips and, you know, uh, feeling well, that the is there is there a way that we as homebrewers can be more kind of scientific about it? Sure. And and actually, if you go to our website, www.gorsevalleyhops.com, we have some newsletters called All Hopped Up. Um, I am afraid I don't remember exactly which newsletter it was, but it would have been from about the 2009 time period. Um, there's an article walking you through the moisture content calculation. Um, not that I'm expecting you to do this because the way we do it, it's, it's not so much a lab, but it's a microwave. We, we take out about a third of a gallon of hops, microwave them till we get all the moisture out, till we get the dry matter. And now it's a simple calculation to figure out how much moisture was in it to begin with. Um, and there I should, should send out props to my mother-in-law for giving me her old microwave to, uh, to get us started. <laughs> Because when we first started, we were using uh, my my old Ronco rotisserie oven. That ovens work well, but they take a long time and they have a tendency to burn the hops. Microwaves work much better. <laughs> Not as much burnage going on uh, and a lot faster. Um, but now for the home grower, using a, a third of a gallon of hops, that's probably your entire <laughs> harvest yeah. right there. Yeah. So there. Uh, what we what I tell people is you need to get down to approximately 22% of your original starting weight. That's 8%. 25% is about 10, 12% moisture content. So basically, weigh your hops at the beginning, and we'll assume that it's at 80% moisture content. It could be as low as about 73%, as high as, oh, upper 90s if it was just raining when you brought them in. Um, but 80% is going to be about the right weight. 
weigh them at that point, and let's say you've got 100 grams, keep drying them until they weigh somewhere in the range of 22 to 25 grams. At that point, you are in the safe zone where you know you've gotten enough moisture out of it. That if you package them up in, in uh, baggies and put them in the freezer and freeze them, you won't see frostbite happening. You won't have to worry about them turning to mush or anything like that. Um, other indications, like I said, you're going to see those cones start to open up. Uh, when, you snap, when you crack them in half, the strig now will feel, it'll feel dry. Not quite brittle. If it gets to the point where the bracts, the leaves are falling off, uh, where you see a lot of yellow dust falling out and that, and that stem, that strig is all powdery, you're now down to about 5% or less. And, uh, oh, boy, you're, you're, you can't add moisture back to them. So stop immediately and get them packaged. Um, you're you're going to have a mess on your hands. So, what are we, so if, you, if, they're, if you package them when they're too wet, you'll get uh, mushy hops. And, yeah, if you, and if you go too far, what's the coincidence? What's the consequences? They just start falling apart. For for us, if we go too far, and and I have managed to do that once, that I'll admit, um, they just start falling apart. The lupulin falls out. You get this magic yellow dust on the floor, and and unfortunately, you can't sweep it back up. The mm. USDA doesn't allow us to sweep it up and put it back in the mixture. It's it's just we're done for. We just made a a beautiful pile of vegetative matter. Mm. <laughs> Now, for, for the home grower, well, okay, you know, USDA is not going to come and inspect your uh, your garage, so <laughs> be ready for that. You could still use it, but it's it's going to be really difficult because it's going to be really dry. So you've got the you've got your hops dried to the proper moisture level. Yep. Now, what do we do with them? Now you want to well. If you're not going to use them immediately, which I always kind of find that amusing is guys go through the whole process of uh, drying them, and then they use them the next day. <laughs> <laughs> it's good practice. It's fun. That's fun to do. I, I understand. Um, but think about doing a wet harvest hop maybe. Uh, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you don't have to do that drying process. But assuming you've got enough, you, you dry them out, and now – the two things that are your enemy for storage lifetime, for shelf lifetime, are sunlight, that UV light, and um, temperature. All right, the the you want to protect them from sunlight as much as possible. So putting them in your freezer, that that's going to pretty much do it. Now on our commercial level, especially the stuff that we sell the homebrew shops, we have to put them into a light barrier bag that prevents any UV light from going through. Because a lot of times they're set in a display case, and the fluorescent tubes are beaming on them, the sunlight's beaming on them, and it's just destroying the quality, destroying the shelf life. So we insist on packaging them ourselves in some kind of light barrier bag. That's also an oxygen barrier bag. Which, forgive me, I, temperature temperature helps you, but oxygen is what destroys you. So when we package them, we go through what's called a, a gas flush. So we, we put them in the bag. We put them up to our machine. It flushes the whole thing with nitrogen to get out the oxygen. Then we suck it out. Then we flush it all again, and then we suck it all again and seal it so it's a, as close as we can get to a perfect vacuum. Um, now, of course, yeah, I'm assuming that most home growers aren't going to buy a three to $15,000 vacuum machine. So if you've got one of those food dehydrator or food vacuum sealers, that you use for your beef jerky and everything else, hey, that's better than nothing. And if you can't do that, put them in a Ziploc bag, squeeze them down as much as possible, put a straw in there, seal it up till it's just a straw, and suck on that straw to get as much air as you can out. Pull the straw out and seal it shut as fast as you can so you have as tight of a bag as possible so there's no oxygen getting in there. And then throw those suckers in the freezer. Putting them in the freezer versus... Room temperature extends life by oh two to six times depending upon what the conditions are. So if you're if you're a home brewer, you won't have nitrogen at home, but you probably will have CO2 at home if you've got a, a kegerator. Could you flush yeah. the bag with CO2? If you can figure out how to do for, do it, go for it. Anything that gets the oxygen away from there uh, will re increase the shelf life of it. Now, if you're going to use them in the next say three months. Uh, this might be a little bit extreme because th they won't degrade that much, especially if they're in the freezer. But if you're planning on holding them for up to a year where you want to brew that last batch so you have something ready with your homegrown stuff for your harvest party the next year, um, uh, you, you might want to look into that. So I've got the way what I've got one of those uh, seal a meal things uh, so yeah. I can suck out most of the air. It's not going to get it's not a perfect vacuum, but, you know, it gets most of the air out. And then I put my hops in a, a deep freeze that doesn't have a uh, defrost cycle. That's best. 
uh, how long will my hops last and be good for brewing? Under those conditions, you should see a shelf life of at least seven months, probably a year before you see any degradation in it. Um, you, you may even be able to come out two years later and open that bag up. Now, they won't smell as fresh as the day you picked them, but your alpha acid should all be there. Your oils and aromas will, will still be there. Um, now, taking it to the extreme, when we first started this out, uh, I'm also Gorse Valley's historian. Uh, this kindly little old lady brought me a can of jar, uh, a jar of canned hops, she said, that her father had done over 110 years ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they, I mean, they hadn't fallen apart, but uh, I wouldn't brew with them. <laughs> <laughs> so they looked the, a little yellow. <laughs> <laughs> so they were actually canned as in uh, like a pressure cooker? Yeah, that's that's one of the ways that they would store them is, is to put them in a jar, cram them all into a jar, put the lid on, and, and can them just like you were canning tomatoes or anything. Um, doesn't get too much of the oxygen out, but what oxygen is that's in there, you know, you're not going to get any more. And so it's a pretty good way of preserving them. Um, but again, even if you're doing it that way, put them in the freezer. Uh, make a little room in there so you can put them in the lower the temperature. Because the, the oxidation, the rotting process, the, the loss of oils, it's a chemical process. And as you probably learned way back in high school chemistry, the lower the temperature, the lower the reaction rate. So that's why we want to put them in the freezer. So how do I know if my homegrown hops aren't good anymore? I mean, I've got, I've probably, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a pack rat, so I think I've probably got, uh, you know, one ounce bags of uh, homegrown hops from, you know, two three years ago in there. Uh, should I just automatically throw them away, or how, how do I know if they're no good at all? You know, open them up, uh, smell. Uh, that's that's about the best. Now, now, of course, uh, if Joe's listening to this right now, uh, he, he's throwing a fit because he's going to say you put them in your gas chromatograph, obviously, and you analyze them. But uh, okay, <laughs> I'm sure you don't have that. Um, <laughs> take take a whiff. What do they smell like? Uh, the alpha acids will last longer than the oils, so maybe use them for bittering hops instead of the aroma. Um, if they just don't smell right, you know. Don't don't put them in. Um, the ultimate is you can make a make a little tea out of them. Boil up some water, throw a few of them in there, make that tea. Take a sip. Does it still smell like you know? Read the package and it says Cascade. Does it still taste like Cascade, or does it maybe taste like garlic or <laughs> marigolds? In that case, what it tastes like in that tea is what it's going to taste like in your beer. If you don't like the flavor, get rid of them. There you go. So the pretty simple. Uh, yet, you know, you, yet you do get questions on it every year. Oh yeah. Are there, are there, are there any other questions that we have an answer that, uh, that you get? Oh, can I, can I just, uh, talk about some of the methods that don't work? Yes, maybe please. Maybe don't work so well. Okay. My, my personal favorite is the, I, and I have no idea where this came from, but somebody propagated the, the story that the best way to dry hops is to put them in a paper grocery bag and set them on top of your refrigerator the supposed heat and airflow coming off the refrigerator is supposed to dry your hops out in no time and and the question i usually get is hey dan i've had them up there for three weeks now and they're really really warm but they don't seem to be dry and they kind of smell bad what's going on my answer is, well, you've put them in a bag where there can be no airflow. So so by definition, you're not going to be able to remove that moisture. Um, so that heat you're feeling is called composting. <laughs> and uh, they are perfect for reapplication to your field right now. Uh, most of that nitrogen that you're putting in those plants ends up in those cones. So they make really great fertilizer, uh, which is why I always scavenge whatever hops that were sent to us that didn't pass muster. I'll, I'll gather those up and put them on my tomatoes, and I get bumper tomato crops because there is so much nitrogen in those cones. It, it, it sounds like a travesty, but you, you didn't want to use these to brew with. So putting them on the top of your refrigerator, that's not going to work. Uh, solar dryers where you lay them out on a screen and put them in the sun or, or somehow heat them, well, same thing. That UV light's going to degrade them pretty quick. That heat, it will dry them in a hurry, but what's your rush, Right. Uh, so many people want to want to get oh we got to get done so I can get them in the freezer no 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 one versus three days versus five days of drying is not going to affect your quality that much uh, if at all all right taking longer time will will do more than adding a whole bunch of heat to get them done quickly bake in the oven again 
Uh, I get this question quite often. I, I how long do I put them, and do I do it at two fifty or three fifty? Neither. <laughs> uh, we had one commercial grower that he did it that way. He the only thing he could find was a corn dryer, belt belt driven corn dryer, and the lowest he could turn it down to was one hundred and eighty degrees. He got those things dried out in three and a half hours. But when we did the analysis for the fresh hop freshness index, it, it they were the equivalent of fourteen year old hops. It just oh they were awful. They were yellow. They were looked like straw, had no flavor. There was still alpha acids there, but that's about it. So anything where you're restricting airflow, don't do it. Anything where you're putting them in sunlight, don't do it. If you're gonna use heat, use it just at the very end. The same as how I described with the dehumidifier. Um, another method. Uh, what's typically called the Alton Brown method. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's that really kind of crazy guy on the Food Network that uh, likes to put his face in the camera and talk loud. Um, <laughs> the good eats guy. Yeah, that guy. I, I I don't know him. I don't know his history, but I'm guessing based on his behavior that he developed that method not so much for drying hops, but perhaps a cousin material. I, I, I have no idea. I think this he used a, it in, in drying uh, herbs and spices and stuff. There like you that. go, basil and oregano. Um, that method is to take two furnace filters and clamp the hops between the furnace filters and then strap it to the back of a box fan. Um, it works. It works, but it's not the best because the problem with a box fan, and and this is something that other people run into when they're building their O's, they, they do the calculation, they figure out, boy, I need 3,000 CFM of air. That's cubic feet per minute. And they go to Walmart and they see this box fan for $18.95 that does 3,000 CFM. So bingo, there we go. The problem is that is 3,000 CFM unencumbered without any static pressure drop, without going through anything. Um, in the HVAC world, they say that the best filter you can possibly use is a cement block. It, yeah, it's not going to let any air flow through, but it's not going to let any dirt through, right? It's going to capture everything. <laughs> well, what you're doing with those furnace filters and those hops is you are restricting the airflow through that, that uh, box fan. And so now you're going from 3,000 CFM down to, oh, you know, 400, maybe 300, and you're not getting enough airflow going through that. You're much better laying them out on a screen and just a light breeze across the top of them, just enough to keep them going. Um, and well, and actually, that brings me to the next one. So some of these complicated OST designs, I'm, I'm all for it. You should, you should see the stuff that I've got going. Actually, I, I think you might have seen the last prototype that we got going, and it, and it did work. Uh, the thing dried a third of an acre at a time. Um, but the fan I had to put on it, was about a 15,000 CFM fan just for a third of an acre. And the design I, I came up with, it's, it was basically a helicopter propeller. Um, <laughs> it did the job, but the neighbors three valleys away were asking what that noise was that was coming. Uh, <laughs> and, and unfortunately, our partners who lived uh, oh, well, 100 yards from where that fan was operating, they had quite a few nights of, of, of no sleep. Um, this you is just, the type of airflow you need to use. You just needed to, to play the ride of the Valkyries. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love the smell of hops in the morning. <laughs> well, the worst part was it was in their giant tin uh, uh, shed, and the whole shed just kind of vibrated from the fan. So not only did you have the noise of the fan, but you had this wah, 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 wah from the <laughs> From the whole, we we got some acoustic blankets in order to damp it all down, and and that that cut down the complaints from three valleys away to only one valley away. So, <laughs> better. so I've got we haven't talked about the uh, the I've got one of those stackable uh, food dehydrators. Sure, you know that you you can dial it down to I think ninety or ninety five degrees is maybe the lowest setting. How about that? Those those actually work really well. Uh, the airflow is about right, um, it, but the key is, is what you said, dialing down the temperature. There's some of those where you can't change the temperature, and in a lot of cases you may end up cooking your hops. Right? Um, if you can, find one that you can dial down the temperature. Try to keep it below 100 degrees. That's uh, On my growers, I always make them take records and logs of temperatures and relative humidity. And if I ever see a number above 100 degrees, they get a phone call being, where they're told, you know, you're being naughty. Same thing for, for those dehydrators. Keep it below 100, and you'll preserve all those oils and aromas that you work so hard to, to grow. Well, that makes me feel better. I was, I was actually holding that back because I, I was feeling a little guilty for drying <laughs> last year's harvest with the food dehydrator. 
uh, instead of going to all the trouble with the uh, the screens in the in the uh, spare bedroom, it did take it did take a lot less time. I mean, we're talking yep. what eight hours or something like that to uh, to get down to what I thought was was proper. Yep. Uh, so okay, well, I feel better about that. Right? <laughs> yep. Those are designed for a whole bunch of airflow to dry your banana chips or your beef jerky. So I mean, they're perfect made for that. The the key there is usually you can only fit about one to two plants worth of harvest in there. So I know there's a lot of home growers out there with ten or twelve or fifteen or I've even seen some with fifty plants. Where I'm going, okay, I, what are you doing with all these? And can I come over to sample? <laughs> Now the good thing about those food dehydrators is you can buy, you know, a bunch of those little shelves or the little stackable things, you know, to, to yeah. build them really high. I guess it probably gets pretty expensive though. Uh, but if you've just got a, a small harvest, that that might not be a bad way to go. I would I would just warn you as as you're stacking those higher and higher, that's more more material for that fan to push through. So make sure you're not over stacking and mm. and overrunning the fan. Yeah, and the the heat would probably be higher on the bottom than at the top as well. Yeah, yeah, you get a little bit of stratification, but we see that in our commercial dryers. Um, that's why that's why there's usually a, a a point where you need to mix the the hops up, um, and and there again you got to be careful because as they get dry, they get really light and loose and fluffy, and they can damage really easy. So when you're moving stuff around towards the end, don't shake them, don't move them around. Well, Dan, this has been fun. I hope that we have uh, we've covered some questions so that you can just send people to this podcast, uh, you know, instead of answering the same questions over and over. Uh, and I know that our listeners uh, appreciate this, and, and I hope uh, that there are brewers out there who have gotten a good harvest and, and can use their, uh, their hops and your tips to brew some wonderful beers. Oh, I hope so, too. I, I'm sure there's some region in the country that got nice temperatures and plenty of rain to get good production. Um, it, it wasn't the upper Midwest, and it sounds like it wasn't where you live either. <laughs> <laughs> but by all means, you know, uh, uh, listen to this podcast, see what's there. Uh, I encourage everyone, you can go to our website and look up those uh, old newsletters. Um, they're free to download. There's lots of information in there. Um, if you still have questions or you have some design that you really want to run past me, I'm I'm free and open. My email is there on the uh, website, or it's dan at gorsevalleyhops.com. Uh, the only thing I ask is that if it does turn out and you brew something up, you got to send me, uh, what, what do they call it, a yeast sample by the U.S. mail? That's right. <laughs> can't, can't send beer by the mail. Just send me a yeast sample. Uh, I'll get you the address. <laughs> UPS is even better. Oh, well, there you go. That works, too. Well, in that case, if you're doing UPS, send a whole six-pack of sam- yeast samples. <laughs> All right, Dan, this has been fun. I appreciate your help, and we'll uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again. Ah, that'll be fun. Well, thanks again to Dan. I am definitely going to listen to this episode again next year, if and when I get a good harvest of hops ready to pick. Hops are fun and beautiful when they're healthy, fun to grow, easy to grow once they're started. All you got to do is just get out of the way, basically, unless the weather doesn't cooperate, and then they turn all brown and burned up. Not so much fun and beautiful then. (laughs) Better luck next year. Uh, Until then, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site, along with combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks again to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are an explosion of chemistry jokes and 31 thermal tote lunch bag cupcakes. Seems like there should have been a colon in there somewhere. In the title, not in the actual lunch bag. It's, it'd be disturbing to find a, an actual colon in your lunch bag, I'm assuming not having. Uh, Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on the site the next time you feel
you like Amazon shopping, we greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodds. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. (laughs) 